So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. Welcome back to our second episode with the legendary Dr. Bob Leahy, uh, master of treating worry. Uh, we were just having a great conversation about uh, what is worry, when is it a problem, um, the evolutionary basis of worries, and just to give a, a, a quick recap of what we talked about is overestimating the probability of bad things happening overestimating how bad things are going to happen, having a over forecast of how uh, negative you're going to feel about things, meaning if I get divorced, I'm going to be miserable forever, where people tend to recover after a year, some human biases that cause us to worry. Uh, we tend to worry about evolutionary based things. So we're more scared of like snakes or public speaking, things related to other people, uh, heights, uh, than we are like marshmallows and cotton balls. Uh, you, you know, like, like we tend to worry about things that in the past, um, either directly correlate or are symbolic of a, of a previous, um, a previous threat. Um, okay. So let, let's jump back into uh, a bit more about what we do when someone does have excessive worry. So, so like, like clinical worry. And I, I know one, uh, technique that you had taught me was a worry period or a worry window. Uh, and I use this technique all the time right yeah so it's what you're describing is uh, uh, a worry time like you know you you set aside uh, a time where you're going to focus on your worry so uh, for example let's say that somebody's worried about losing their job uh, now what happens with people who worry is that these intrusive thoughts the thoughts that just keep bombarding your mind they show up and the worrier thinks, oh, I got to really pay attention to it. They get hijacked by the thought and they're off and running and then they can't sleep. They can't focus on what's going on. They can't enjoy the present moment. They can't get their work done because they're worried. So think about like you and I see patients on a regular basis and it's not like just people show up at your office and say, I need to talk to you. They have appointments and you have appointments with them. So, what I say to people is that one of the things that you f uh, feel is that you're constantly being hijacked by these thoughts. We know that trying to suppress the thought will only make it bounce back. So we're not going to ask you to suppress the thought because thought suppression doesn't work. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is to make an appointment with that thought uh, and then have a series of techniques that you can use during that appointment. So write down the worry, like, you know, let's say it's 10 o'clock in the morning, I might lose my job. You have the same thought at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 o'clock, whatever. Put that off, let's say, to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, your worry time, between 3 and 3.15 or 3.30. You have an appointment with your worries, okay? So what do you do at 3, 3 o'clock? Well, you look at, how, how upset or anxious were you uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning? Well, maybe you were 90% anxious. But since 10 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you've been doing other things. So you're a lot less anxious about it. So, I mean, often that's what happens when people try to put it off till later. Um, so what does that mean? It means actually my anxiety will decrease over time. Well, that's an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. So actually when I'm doing something else, like distracting myself with work or other things, exercise, whatever, uh, my anxiety, my worry tends to decrease. Next, ask yourself, um, is this going to be productive for me to continue dwelling on it? In other words, is there going to be an action plan today? Is there something I can do today that will really make sure I don't lose my job. Well, maybe one thing you could do today is do your work. I know that when I when I procrastinated on things that I'm writing, you know, I distract myself with all kinds of 
ridiculous, you know, reading every newspaper in the world. I can get my hands on on things I have absolutely no interest in. <laughs> and then, then at the end of the day, oh, I didn't do any work on my book. So I feel kind of lousy. But then I find if I actually do the work on my book, I actually feel better. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like uh, when in doubt, take action. So I could either worry about losing my job or I could do my job. That would be productive worry. All right. So let's say that you realize that continue to worry about it is not the same thing as taking action today. So it's not going to be productive. So it's unproductive worry. Um, then with the unproductive worry, what would be the advantage if I just accepted I don't know right now or accepted that there's some possibility I could lose my job, right? Um, you know, I was talking with uh, 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 many, many years ago with um, uh, a, a, a person who was a very senior executive at a Fortune 500 uh, company. And... Um, and I was an academic at the time, and I was thinking, you know, I, I would be coming up for tenure in a couple of years. And I said, oh, I've never had tenure uh, in a, any job I've ever had, and I don't worry about it. I said, well, why, why is that? He said, because I have skills the marketplace demands. This is a very mm -hmm. prominent economist. And it absolutely transformed my mind that my security is not in a job. It's in the skills that I can mar I can sell in the marketplace, which then led me to try to develop more skills and pursue uh, setting up my own thing uh, here in New York City, the American Institute for Cognitive Therapy. Uh, and so it's it's kind of like um, you could either worry about something, or you could take action that's productive, uh, or you could accept the uncertainty. Uh, or you can accept that maybe something unfair or something bad could happen, but examine your ability to be resilient. As we were talking about earlier, what other problems or obstacles have you overcome? Are there other people who have handled divorce or loss of a job or loss of income? Um, you know, taking, a, taking the catastrophe out of it. That, uh, you know, it's like <clears throat> people who... who uh, who worry about um, uh, losing money or getting ill or whatever it is. Um, most people who get ill recover. Most people who lose money eventually, you know, get back on, on track. And uh, Americans uh, are the wealthiest large country in the world, which means that probably 99% of the people in the world are living on a lot less money than whatever you are living on. So it's it's kind of like, we, we tend to, during the worry time, is it productive or unproductive? Can I accept the uncertainty? Can I accept that some bad things can happen? Uh, can I examine my psychological immune system, my ability to handle difficulties, my resilience, that kind of thing? What are the resources? What is the probability that this is going to happen? You know, uh, what, is the, what is the best possible outcome? What is the worst possible outcome, and what is the most likely outcome? Mm -hmm. So, for example, somebody thinking about losing their job, uh, she might think the best possible outcome is I get pr uh, pr uh, promoted. Uh, worst possible outcome, I lose a job, I never get another job. The most probable outcome is that my boss is in a bad mood and she'll get over it and I'll be fine like I have in the past. So, we we can use a whole range of techniques. I think the other way of looking at worry is like the crazy uncle at a holiday meal, you know, coming out with their you know, conspiracy theories about uh, how people are implanting uh, uh, cells in your brain so that the Chinese can take take over your body and make you the new Man Manchurian candidate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, so, so, you know, so that crazy uncle at your holiday parties, um, you could argue with them and then you could ask yourself, what's the likelihood you're going to persuade them? Uh, what's the likelihood you're going to come away feeling good? What's the likelihood that other people are going to be annoyed with listening to this diatribe? 
Um, or you could ignore them. You could just simply say, well, yeah, I guess, Uncle Bill, that you, you have a lot of creative ideas. I'm glad. Thank you for sharing them. You, know, you could be a diplomat. So you could do the same thing with your worries. You could treat them as uh, background noise. You can treat them as a telemarketing call. You know, that's, oh, spam call. Oh, yeah, I want to talk to that person for 45 minutes, right? Uh, <clears throat> and you could uh, treat it as something in your spam filter in your email. You can imagine the worries are you're in a train station, you're in Grand Central Terminal, trains are coming in all different directions. You can decide that worry train is not the one I want to get on. You can focus on committed action, and it could be anything. So it could be exercise. It could be taking a walk around the block. It could be if you have a, a cat or a dog, petting them, spending time with your partner, working on a project, listening to music. In other words, you can think, worry is one of the things I can do. But there are other things I can, and I can only put my mind in one place. And if I'm putting my mind into watching a video or working on something or listening to music or, uh, or you know, creating music, like one of my patients uh, is, a, is an executive, but he's also a very talented, creative musician. And so one of his homework assignments is play his guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, there are a whole lot of things that you can do other than worry. Um, and it's something that people who come in, as I said, 38% of the people say they worry every day. Uh, people are not worrying because they want to suffer. What they're doing is they think this is going to prevent something bad from happening. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's important to make sure you have insurance, that you have reservations, that you have plans, that you've you know done your homework, that you've checked on. Did you get the... Uh, the link to the podcast, you know, that there, there are things that are useful to do, mm -hmm. but worry may not be the most useful thing to do. Uh, uh, and it may not, and no matter how much you are hypervigilant, um, it's not going to completely eliminate bad things from happening. It's kind of like, like people with OCD. Um, people with OCD say, well, you know, I, if I touch that, I could get, you know, contaminated with something deadly. Now, the probability that touching this desk is going to kill me is greater than zero. Maybe it's one in 500 million. I don't know what the odds are, but it's greater than zero. But if I keep letting my OCD, uh, if they keep it from letting me live a normal life, the likelihood I'll have OCD a year from now, five years from now, is very, very high. So it's kind of like I could either give up the avoidance or I could, uh, I could keep trying to reduce the risk of infection to zero, but increase the risk of OCD to 90%. So worry is kind of like that. Um, you know, so 90% of the things that people worry about don't happen. 79% of the time, they handle it better than they thought they, they did. Um, and so it's, it's something that we, we can have different strategies. And like a lot of people, when they worry, they, you know, I outlined some strategies for handling worry that don't work and that only perpetuate worry. So, for example, uh, reassurance seeking. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, will I do okay? You know, will my partner leave me? Will I lose my job? And my friend or my partner, you know, tries to reassure me. What that does, the same thing with OCD, that just reinforces the idea that the only way to feel safe is get reassurance. It's that the world is going to collapse around me unless I get reassurance. What happens when the reassurance is not there or I don't believe the reassurance? Another thing that doesn't work is use of drugs or alcohol. I mean, uh, like drugs like marijuana or uh, other, um, other uh, you, know, uh, you know, recreational drugs or alcohol. It may, it may dull my senses, but it makes me more vulnerable to anxiety and mm. depression. And what about Xanax? 
So that that's not an illegal drug. Yeah. So <clears throat> so Xenix uh, pills don't teach you skills, right? So I it's kind that. of like like you know like we like we look at Steve Holland from Vanderbilt's done a lot of research on this on, on depression as an example, and it seems that there's some evidence and pretty good evidence that taking antidepressant uh, medications actually increases the likelihood of recurrence and prolongation of uh, depression. It's kind of like if you use cognitive behavior therapy uh, correctly and you, and, you, and you live what you might call an antidepressant life, right? Like you exercise every day, you don't overdrink, uh, you maintain contact with people, you challenge your negative thoughts, you do mindfulness, you accept things, you solve problems, all the things that we know work. You know, if you live this antidepressant life, it's a lot better than taking Prozac, you know, because now you have skills that work and you can carry them forward. So the long-term outcome for CBT is better than it is for people who just rely on medication. I'm not saying medication is never useful. Sometimes medication can give you uh, a, a, a bit of uh, uh, freedom from the intensity of the emotions that that trap you. Mm -hmm. But just don't stop there. Like, you know, then actually learn the skills yeah, and techniques right. to ad address the, the yeah. emotional states on top of it. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, th I think another thing that that worry does, like all of the anxiety disorder all of the anxiety disorders have a sense of urgency and think about you know the the woody allen character roaming through the jungle afraid of uh murray from the next tribe or the tiger or whatever um urgency was key you know get out of there as quickly as possible or you'll get killed so worry is like an alarm clock it's like a fire alarm going off get out of here, do something. Something is approaching us uh, very, very quickly and it's dangerous and we've got to get out. <clears throat> so one of the chapters in the book in The Worry Cure is um, putting time on your side. So there are a number of ways of doing it. What did you worry about 10 years ago? What did you worry about a year ago? How did you become indifferent to that? So one technique that I find useful, what I call the indifference technique. How did you become indifferent to these things? Well, they never happened, or if they did happen, I cope with them, right? Um, how do you think you'll feel about this worry a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? So let's say you you had a party and you have uh, you have an argument with somebody at the party and you worry about what people might think about you. How are you going to think about that a year from now? So putting time on your side is stepping away, getting into a time machine, looking back and say, what? That happened a year ago. I forgot that. Like if you think about your former relationships with girlfriends or people you're involved with, whatever it is, you may have a hard time remembering who they are years later. <laughs> but it might have broken your heart yeah. at one point. Funny to think uh, about, but yes. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, memory can also memory can often remind you about the value of indifference, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's like, uh, gee, I no longer care about that, and I didn't take any Prozac or Xanax for that. I just evolved in my life and moved on on my train journey to other things. Uh, the same thing with the things we worry about today. Uh, tra trainees will ask me, well, isn't not worrying avoidance then? Right, because the worrying is getting them anxious, and you know we, we want them to like you know the exposure model or or enduring you know, going through your emotions to get to the other side. Yeah. So why is not worrying not avoidance? I gave you a double, triple, quadruple negative there. I have to get my Venn diagrams out <laughs> and figure out what you said, but yeah. So it's um, worry. Worry is an avoidance of the existential possibility that something bad could happen that you cannot control or that you won't control. So worry is is that sort of thing. Um, and it's kind of like like you could worry about dying or you could live a full life. I would rather, I, I absolutely sure, uh, 
I love you as a buddy, Jason, but I'm absolutely sure you're going to die. Yes. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to die before you do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to worry about these things. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't care about you or I don't care about me, but it's just going to be that's the way the world is. You know, uh, I'm not going to be freezing my brain or any part of my anatomy. So it's just, I will die. Absolutely. So what is the answer to dying is living, right? Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you know, worry is that somehow I'm going to get through life without suffering, without having bad things happening, as opposed to trying to get to my life, having as good a life as I can have. Um, so it's, it's, um, I think the other part of it is one of the things I talk about in the book is to use your emotions rather than worry about them. So, for example, um, uh, all emotions are temporary. Every emotion you ever had lasted for a finite period of time, often a short period of time. So you can often see a patient who comes in who describes himself as being very depressed and life is not worth living, and in the course of a session, 30 minutes later, they're laughing and joking or whatever it is. Um, so I had a patient years ago who was afraid of crying. And in the course of the session, she actually cried. And we talked about what made her cry. Um, and so 10 minutes toward the end of the session, I said, you were afraid of... Uh, you were afraid of crying. Um, you were afraid of crying. You cried. You stopped crying. What do you make of that? And so her thought was that if I start crying, I'll never stop crying. It'll go out of control. Mm -hmm. Last a long time. And that you'll humiliate me, which was her experience growing up and with her former husband being humiliated. So we have this we have this fear of negative emotion. But to live a full life, you're going to have negative emotions. You're not going to be uh, uh, you know here here's the here's the thought experiment, a famous philosophical uh, uh, essay on the experience machine. The experience machine is this. Um, we're going to hook Jason up to these electrodes that look very much like your headset. And we're going to uh, send electrical impulses to your brain for three years. You're going to be in a dark room. Nobody's going to be around you. Uh, you'll be functionally unconscious, but you'll be experiencing pleasure all the time. 100% hmm. pleasure. So this is the hedonistic uh, ideal, right? So you you know, just positive emotions. Um, we take your headset off after three years. We say, Jason, this was an experiment. We put you in the experience machine where you had these wonderful experiences that were all artificial. Um, we can put you back in for another three years, or we can send you out to your real life. Which do you prefer? Most people would prefer the real life. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they want to live in the real world. They don't want to have an artificial world. Um, <clears throat> so in a sense, what, what do we find when we have uh, painful emotions? Like you lose somebody or uh, you have a breakup in a relationship or you have a friendship that goes wrong or something goes wrong at work or you make a mistake, whatever. Um, we have a life with meaning. And meaning is, the experience machine is absent of any meaning because all it is is pleasure, right? It's not like, oh, you know, um, I helped a friend and they got sick and they died and that was so painful, but it was so meaningful to me to be there for my friend or for them to be there for me. I went through a painful thing. They were there for me. So humans are maybe... Maybe we're unique in our capacity to need meaning, to need something larger than our pleasure and more profound than our pleasure. Hmm. And culture is a meaning-making system. Um, 
what one way that that I conceptualize <clears throat> worry as avoidance is 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 because it's the opposite of acceptance. That if you're worrying to prevent right. the problem, you then are not accepting that's a exactly. possibility. That's exactly right. So yeah. if I'm worrying about not getting fired, yeah. worrying about not getting yeah. fired, worrying about not getting yeah, yeah, fired, yeah. and you are not living in the possibility that I'm going to get fired, and that's coming right. out of that worry is so uncomfortable because if you're not problem solving it. You then are are by default accepting the possibility that you could get fired. Well, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I think the acceptance thing is that almost anything can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. The person who worries, it's like the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. Love that movie. <laughs> that was a great movie. I know. I had no clue what was going on for a third of it, and then I got it, and I was like, "This is amazing." Well, that's kind of like life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's my life. You every have no day. idea what the hell is going on most of the time. It's just, you know, it's like one historian says that history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> it is. So, yeah, everything everywhere all at once. The worrier, in a way, is kind of like that, isn't he? It's kind of like, oh my God, everything's happening. I'm going to have brain cancer. My partner's going to leave me. I'm going to lose my job. Plane's going to crash. All of this kind of stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you take one thing at a time, one thing at a time, and then look at it. You know, what's the likelihood that I have brain cancer? What's the likelihood? What could, what could I do if I if I got law if I got a breakup or lost my job or my income decreased or eliminate whatever? Uh, how could I handle it? You know mm -hmm. that sort of thing. We we have a psychological immunity system. I mean, how could our ancestors have gotten through constant trauma? It wasn't like you know, trigger warnings a hundred thousand years ago. There were tigers and wolves and other humans, mm -hmm. starvation, natural disasters, freezing to death, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you lost people that you cared about all the time. All the time. Right. All the time. Right. Yeah. I mean, if people lived past the age of thirty five, they were old. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and boy. so there was this kind of like normalcy of loss disaster, suffering. You got an infection, you'd be dead in a month, mm -hmm. you know? So it's it's kind of like we evolved to handle true disasters that happen. I'm not saying we shouldn't have sympathy for ourselves or other people facing these things, uh, but only a very small percentage of people who are actually exposed to a trauma develop PTSD. I remember after 9-11 in New York, the World Trade Center was hit, and 3,000 people were killed. And most people in New York had some kind of at least vicarious exposure to the trauma because they were here and they mm -hmm. saw it on the television and they thought another plane's going to crash or explode, whatever it is. Very few people actually develop PTSD. I mean, the, the expectation were going to be, oh, all these people are going to have PTSD. But... Very, very few people actually develop PTSD. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they weren't anxious, but they weren't waking up with nightmares and over drinking to get through the day. So it's it's something that we often underestimate our ability to handle difficult things. Mm -hmm. And one way of handling difficult things is to have fun. And I think one of the one of the uh, one of the ways of of dealing with worry is to have a lot of fun in your life, to have a lot of good things happening. It's kind of either I could, like I could either worry about something or I could go to an art museum or take a nice walk through Central Park or mm -hmm. spend time with my wife or, you know, see my friends or talk to Jason or, you know, I could do lots of other things that are pleasurable, fun, and meaningful to me other than worry. Mm -hmm. Worry is a strategy I could use. Uh, do I have reservations? Okay, let me check. I do. I went on open table. I have reservations. I'm cool. I can set it aside. Uh, but the best way to handle the fear of death is to live a full life, so I, not I, to worry about. I, I think t to your point, like like one way that I look at human beings is that we have these prefabricated systems that that are looking to do something. So so I'll give a um, an example. We are programmed to be able to recognize hundreds of thousands of different plants. But because we're not in the wild anymore, they see that kids that, that are, are grow up in nature, at, at, you know, say like three years old, four years old, the amount of plants they could recognize is the amount of plants that are, I mean, is the amount of brand signs that our kids could recognize. 
because they are programmed to recognize and and discriminate between different different things and because we're a commercial society and they're going down the road they then could before they could read mcdonald's they know what that mcdonald's sign yeah, yeah. looks like yeah. and we have a system for threat detection and and to address problems at a constant basis because that's what we were evolved to do yeah. and so that is going to get, to get filled in with something yeah even though we're not trying yeah. to survive the way that we were that system is going to put things in the bucket yeah we we have uh, all all species who who move around have threat detection because threat uh, it it's it's more important to detect the life life threatening um, uh, predator than it is to detect uh, a very uh, pleasant looking pond with ducks flapping their wings. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing ducks on a pond flapping their wings gives you a great feeling of serenity. But that's not going to help you survive, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to help you avoid a predator. The predator is not going to say, uh, oh, Jason is like sitting by the side of his pond with his legs crossed in a yoga position enjoying watching the ducks flap their wings so we're not going to attack jason because you know he's a very peaceful person um so we don't like like the news the cnn news is not going to the breaking news is not going to be oh isn't this a very beautiful little pond with ducks on it mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and nobody would watch <laughs> nobody would watch it you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, let me see the hawk coming down. That's what I want to see. Yeah. Right? Well, so. if you think about it, we have to ask people to do mindfulness or meditations or guided exactly. imagery. Right. We don't have right. to ask anybody to look for bad <laughs> things on the internet like that. That we have to ask them to do less. Right. They just do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's it's so important to realize that wherever we put our mind, that's what's going to be the emotion we have. So on my screensaver on my Mac. Uh, I have a photo of a, a beautiful old tree with no leaves on it growing out of a wetlands with lily pads, mm -hmm. right? There's no threat in this picture. It's very calm. Uh, of course, I could have like a, a picture of an axe murderer coming charging toward me and, you know, an avatar of some sort. Uh, that would not make my day very comfortable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's 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 interesting because we... We, we evolved for a world that was very dangerous. We evolved in a world where food was scarce and unpredictable, right? It's sort of like, why do people binge eat? Because it was adaptive to binge eat, mm -hmm. adaptive to binge eat. Eat as much as you can, as quickly as you can, because you never know when a predator is going to come and take your food and kill you or there'll be no food in the future. So we, we became walking warehouses of binge eating. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem we have is that we have a super abundance of food and we still have the appetite for high calorie, high sweet foods um, and binge on them. So, so the thing about worry is that the goal is not to eliminate worry. The goal is to have a better way of relating to your worry. That's why I, I value the productive and unproductive distinction. Is this going to be productive? I might have a plan, a to-do list today. If not, unproductive. Let me move on to acceptance, acceptance of uncertainty, acceptance of lack and control. Uh, let, me, uh, let me think about these thoughts or what I'm worried about or ruminating about. Let me imagine rising up, you know, maybe a 10,000 feet in the air, and I'm looking down. If you've ever been on the top of a mountain, you look down, uh, like little cars look like about this big, and mm -hmm. you know, humans you can't even see. So if we rise above, in a way, this is kind of like a, a mindful detachment, call it. Rising above, looking down, you know, being up on the balcony, looking down at these interactions. How would somebody else see it? How would I see it a year from now? This kind of detached, mindful awareness description without judging, just describe what happens. And then describe the things around you. Like I'm sitting here at my desk, there's a picture of my wife, there's uh, some pens over there, my phone, glass of water, some uh, headphones. You know, all of that, I can shift my mind somewhere else. When we first 
when people in CBT first began using mindfulness, uh, you know, it was Lindell Siegel and John Teasdale and Mark Williams, they described it as attention training. And what it really was, was people who were prone to recurrent depression had this overgeneralized way of thinking about things like, oh, last summer was a difficult time or, or when I was there, uh, I was unhappy. It's so overgeneralized, I have no idea what you're referring to. Versus last summer, I went out on a kayak and it tipped over, but I got out of the water and righted it and I got back in. That's a specific event. I can take a picture of it. So attention, mindfulness was paying attention to the specific detail, the present moment. My breath, parts of my body, the sounds and paths over here, uh, things I see, paying attention. Worry is over, always about something that's not the present moment. It's the future or rumination about the past. So bringing myself to the present moment, like this glass of water, has just a little bit of water left and my thirst is going to be parched mm -hmm. if I drink this water and there's no more water. But here's the water right here and I can focus on that. If I think about, you know, not having any water for the next uh, five days, I could worry about that. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to happen. The present moment is right here. And the present moment usually isn't terrifying. Usually. Sometimes it is. Yeah, it's not terrifying. For the mo yeah. for, for yeah. most point, the present yeah. moment is actually yeah. elicits a neutral yeah. to slightly positive affect. Right. Or maybe and slightly negative. And the present moment always becomes the past moment. Mm. The present moment is gone the minute you describe it as the present moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so as you know, my, my first career was doing assessments full time and I used to do mental status exams and we would think about thought process and thought content. And <clears throat> when you talk about um, your techniques, I, I often divide them into thought content versus thought process of what you're talking about. Right. Where thought process is, well, how do how do I relate to my thoughts like the mindfulness, yeah, mindfulness, yeah. detachment, yeah. Um, deferred worry. And then the thought content is decatastrophizing and, and, and noticing your ability to handle it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's uh, for people that are listening to all these different techniques, I think thinking about those two buckets will help you organize two different ways to address worry with your clients. Right. Yeah. And all of it's valuable. So yes. it's, I mean, one of the things that I value is the work of all my colleagues. I mean, I value uh, the work of Beck and the whole Beck group, uh, Steve Hayes, uh, Acceptance Commitment Therapy, DBT, Metacognitive Therapy, the Mindfulness Approach, uh, the Behavioral Activation Approach. <clears throat> uh, all of these are valuable to us. I mean, the best toolbox is the most comprehensive toolbox, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like, uh, like do you do you do you get the same ethnic food every day? Nope, I don't. I like a lot of diversity right. in my cuisine. <laughs> yep. So, so like with my wife, uh, you know, the other day, I said, well, what should we order in? You know, we order in, we're New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. said, Italian. Well, we had Italian three nights ago. Uh, Greek. Oh, we had Greek on Saturday. Uh, Chinese. We had Chinese the other day. You know, it's sort of like, that's our toolbox. I won't, I don't, I'm, I grew up, I'm half Irish, half Italian. I know I look like an Irish cop from Boston, from <laughs> South Boston, uh, probably some of my relatives. But I was raised on Italian food. And anybody who was raised on Italian food felt sorry for people who are not Italian uh, because you didn't have Italian food. Mm -hmm. um, I could probably eat Italian food every single meal and be happy, but, um, but I do like variety. And so in a sense, the toolbox here is having all the different tools, all the different cuisines, all the different approaches, all the different ideas. And what we know, by the way, the, the research by George Bonanno at Columbia on resilience shows that what predicts resilience is not one thing. It's not cognitive restructuring. It's not um, acceptance. It's not mindfulness. It's not problem solving. It's the ability to use whatever you can. It's flexibility in the tools that you use. Not the, uh, the ACT model of the psychological flexibility. It's flexibility in the tools I use. So sometimes uh, challenging your negative thoughts and the Beck 
you know, well, what is the probability? Am I catastrophizing? Am I mind reading? Am I fortune telling? What's the evidence? What somebody else say? That could be useful. Sometimes behavioral activation is useful for worry. You know, get out and start doing things. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes mindful meditation. Sometimes metacognition is worry. That's the key thing. We we have to get away from brands and schools and loyalty to systems and think about our patients as the most important school of thought. What is going to help this individual who's suffering? I want to be able to use every tool that's available. So, and I find that exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it means I'm constantly learning and my patients are teaching me. I don't know if you ever had this experience. You're talking to a patient and they come up with, you know, this great idea and you're thinking, why haven't I thought of that? Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, or, Ab absolutely. Or my wife has been telling me that for years. And <laughs> it's about time I listen. You know? <laughs> so it becomes like, you know, you begin yeah. thinking, yeah, maybe there's something new here. And that's the great thing about our field, Jason. We're not stuck. We're not stuck in Freudian therapy in 1910. We're constantly evolving and learning. Mm-hmm. And I, I really appreciate you saying that because there's so many young clinicians or clinicians that are trying to learn CBT. And, and I, I actually sat in your office and I said, I am so confused. I just did an ERP training. I did this Beck training. I did this CPT training. I did this prolonged exposure training. And everybody's telling me that this is the way. And some of them are kind of incompatible. Or they're different. And, 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 and this is what you told me. That, that, yeah, that there's yeah. different ways of approaching yeah. and treating yeah. things and it's getting out of the mindset of this is the way rather right. looking at, at the human as a more right. complex system that various different pathways could work. Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I mean, the thing about it is that, that um, I mean, some of it's like trial and error. It's like how do, how do psychiatrists determine which antidepressant is going to work? Mm -hmm. What if they give a blood test? Uh, that's nope. ridiculous. They, it's trial and error. Yep, let's try Lexapro first, and if that doesn't work, we'll move the Zoloft. Right. off. And we'll add something else, whatever it is. So trial and error is like, I don't know what's going to work for this person. Mm -hmm. uh, I may have some intuition that maybe some metacognitive techniques might work or some mindful detachment might work or whatever, or whatever. I don't know. So let me present to the patient that here's the great thing. We don't know exactly what's going to work. But we know that there are a lot of things that work. Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out what's going to work, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's like what's the best diet? A balanced diet. You know, don't eat iceberg lettuce every meal. You know, so it's, yeah, you know. you'll get deficiencies. <laughs> um, and, and I think just as important to recognize that different people are going to respond more effectively to, to potential sure. different type yeah. of therapy yeah. techniques. I also think that people forget that over time in different situations, people are going to respond different to different therapy techniques where in this moment with this problem, the cognitive restructure really worked. But in this other moment, that that's not right. doing it. Right. And they might yeah. have to use a different yeah. technique that people right. are variable. Yeah. They're dynamic. Yeah. They're not yeah. cars. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you don't. Doing therapy is not following a religion. Mm -hmm. you know, we we don't have therapy rituals that we we engage in all the time. Um, I mean, a lot of people talk about fidelity to the system. I think you should have fidelity to your partner, but not to a psychological system. So, the idea you should have fidelity to the patient. The patient didn't come in to see you because you're following some kind of you know you know religious uh, fetish in your practice. Mm -hmm. They came in because they think that you have tools they, they can use. Um, let's find out which tools are going to work for that person. Yeah. Um, you know, the flexibility is the important one. Yeah, I, I very much um, over time have come into this integrated model of like, how does, how does this all fit together? Right. Um, you know, how does my training in here and this modality and that modality, yeah. how does it make sense in, in one larger therapy kind of organism? Yeah. And having an understanding of human nature that mirrors that because ther therapy reflects how human beings actually work, or right. at least it should. And so, and so we, we can see the movement. Uh, even in ABCT now, we see this movement that, uh, you know, my friend Steve Hayes and Stefan Hoffman, uh, I had dinner with them uh, last month at ABCT. It was so great to spend time with both of them. Uh, they've moved toward this common processes model. You know, it's like a trans-theoretical, trans-diagnostic model 
let's use all these tools. And I think even the unified protocol model of Barlow has a lot to, uh, to be said for it. So we're moving away from specific school toward a whole range of things that can mm-hmm. be used. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great time to be a CBT therapist because we have all these different schools of thought. We don't have to battle with each other. We have to form a NATO force. Mm-hmm. Of <laughs> bring our allies. We're on the same team. We're trying to accomplish the same goals and human suffering to make the world a better place, to give our patients and ourselves as many tools as possible, and to constantly be open to learning and the learning from our own mistakes. Um, also reducing the suffering of our students. What, when they have to learn all of these different things versus learning the common factors that are going to work, it's a much easier uh, a right. pill to swallow. It's much right. easier to conceptualize, to digest, right. and master than having right. to learn all these separate di- different right. things. At least I think so. Well, I would, say, I would say to somebody who's finishing their PhD, here's the bad news. You don't know. You don't know enough. You have to keep learning. Mm-hmm. Here's the good news: you don't know enough. You have to keep learning, right? I love the. I, the reason I write books is uh, I have a boredom disorder. I'm always thinking about. Well, there's something else I want to learn about. Like I want to write a book on envy now, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm interested in envy as a topic, uh, and so it it sort of keeps us going. It's sort of like. You don't know everything. You always have something else to learn. Isn't that a good thing? I mean, can you imagine if your job was putting the labels on vials at a pharmacy at Dwayne Reed? That was your job. Mm-hmm. You already know how to do it. You know, you knew how to do it when you're 21. You'll know how to do it when you're 61. You're going to spend 40 years doing it. Not us. Mm-hmm. We're constantly learning. We're in an open system. We're synergistic with our patients and with other uh, theoretical and, and therapeutic approaches. So it's a wonderful way of viewing your life because it builds on your curiosity and your sense of being effective and what we call the growth mindset. I'm always growing. Mm-hmm. So well, all the people who are out there listening to this, uh, there's no one answer. The good news is that there are many answers. Find the ones that work. And um, I, j- just to reflect that, like pe- people listen to me on this these podcasts, and I'm talking to all these different experts, and I have these conversations, and you know, talking about various things. I mean, I I find that I knew something wrong often, or that I was doing something wrong often, and I'm very much in a state where I am still learning yeah. an absolute ton. Right. right. Um, every every I think I am a much better therapist I am today than I was five years ago, and then I was a year ago, and I really hope that I'm a much better therapist five years from yeah, now yeah. Uh, than I am today. But I think people, if you don't have that mindset, you think I, sh- I should be amazing right now, right. but that limits your growth mindset. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I just talking about learning skills, you have an amazing technical skill manual uh, like like a book, a big bluish book, but I can't remember the name of it. Cognitive that- Therapy Techniques. Thank you. All right. Um, and we're, fin- we're now finishing the third edition of the treatment plans for depression and anxiety book. Oh, so, awesome. So it should uh, be out in a year from now. So keep your eye out for that book. If you could grab the, the book that I just mentioned, it is literally pages upon pages upon pages of different techniques that you could do. Uh, in CBT for a various amount of problems. You go to the table of contents and you look at worry and then you see like 25 different techniques, <laughs> probably with a worksheet that you can learn off of. Um, I get that book for every single one of my trainees. I highly recommend everybody pick up a copy of that. Well, Bob, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> for Jason. Coming always, on the show. Uh, you're always very, uh, very generous with your comments and you're doing a great job. It's always good to see you and, and talk with you, Jason. And I hope you have a great, uh, a great day. Okay. Thanks again for coming on. Okay. Take care, my friend. <laughs>